Hello, and welcome to Piano Tech Radio Hour, the weekly bridge to the future of the Piano Tech community. I'm David Anderson. And I'm Ethan Janney. And we're here to ask great questions, and then we'll shut up and listen to some of the authorities, experts, and most outstanding personalities in our little world of pianos. So, put on your best set of headphones, and let's get started. Thank you all for being here. And just a quick reminder that Piano Tech Radio Hour is being brought to you by Piano Technicians Masterclasses, an online educational resource that offers you cutting edge instruction from piano industry masters without leaving your home. You can find out more at www.pianotechniciansmasterclass.com and find whatever option suits you to sign up and join us. All right, David, yes, what are you about to introduce so, uh, for us? 25 minutes before 11 uh, Pacific time, before 2 uh, Eastern time, um, we got a text from Boaz Kirschenbaum, our guest today, saying, my head is filled up with a cold. I can't talk. I can only croak. I'm going to have to, I, I can't even hardly sit up. I'm really, really sick. I'm so so sorry. I feel terrible, but I can't. I I I don't think I can go. I think I'm too sick. And so we said, no problem. Get better. He got COVID. Worried about it. Uh, we'll, he'll know in the next couple of days. I'll send him good energy. And uh, so we're just gonna have a tool talk, man. I want the wisdom of this room. Look at all these insane. We got 300 million years of piano technological, you know, experience in this in this little room in this little Zoom event. Is that a full eon? Is that yeah. a full eon? Worth eon. Of years? Or 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 many eons. Many eons. <laughs> um, and I I want some really, you know, like. The last time you were working on a piano and you were trying to get it just right and you just couldn't get it right or you figured something out that did get it right or something. I, I would love to have some questions about the finer aspects of regulation, tuning, voicing, diagnostics, coming to a piano and figuring out what the hell is going on with this piano. Why does it do this and this and this and this and this? And uh, uh, do Bob not. Human has do jumped not. in already, and he says yeah. that he wants to talk about his chopstick voicing tool shaped like yours. Okay, talk to Mr. Jurgen Goering about his chopstick voicing tool, and remember the secret kind of protocol, I put in a long needle for treptix voicing, at least 15 millimeters uh, extending from the needle. And then I bend it up at a 10 or 12 degree angle so that I can get under the string quickly up. The bent knee works to come over to and it's right to air all the way under. I'm going to unmute Carl here because he's the one who introduced this. I don't know if this is going on for anybody else, but is you getting it frozen, David? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, yeah. yeah. Why don't you give your side of things here, uh, Carl, for a second? Well, no, listen, I, I, I want to reiterate what I learned this from David. And I, I bend it a little bit more. I, again, a uh, half an inch, 15 millimeters. I bend it probably uh, 15 degrees, maybe even 20 degrees. And I had, I had, yesterday I serviced a brand new C7 where the complaint was two of the bass notes just had like a little bit 
extra high frequency buds and, and a brand new C7. And I use David's thing. I put a tube under the string cuts on the, on the, on the two bass notes. And if you flip it over, the, 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 the needle is now pointing down a little. And if you want to do just like a little sugar coating within the grooves, just tiny, tiny sugar coating to just make it a little sweeter at the top. I use David's, uh, I use my chopstick voicing tool like David configured it. And I had the happiest client. It, it just absolutely solved the problem. So it, lots of times it's hard to, for me to use my chopstick voicer. It's set up for the hammer to go into check and then to you know spike it with, when it's in check. It's much easier to just kind of slide underneath the grooves and bending the needle is the key. Cool. Thank you so much for sharing that. I put a little a thing in the chat if anybody actually has it on hand. You think you're welcome to hold it up. Uh, we mentioned that, that actually maybe Jurgen has uh, Jurgen is on board. I don't know how uh, available he is, but uh, and Mark Steiger says I just bought Jurgen's chopstick voicing tool. Use it for the first time on Thursday. Fantastic. Very nice. Whoa, Carl just did a relay. He's zooming in and out of the Zoom screen here. I guess that's appropriate for Zoom. I'm assuming he ran to go get his chopstick poisoning tool. <laughs> yeah, I, I am. <laughs> nice. <laughs> here, you know, so, so, so listen, that's the needle. I don't know if people can see that, Ethan. Now, if I talk, it'll probably make you off screen for a second, but, uh, Hold it up in front of your face more, in front of where the camera is. Yeah. And put it in front of your face. Oh, you know, your, let, let me just click your... behind here. Here. There you go. Can you see it? That This is a magic trick, bending the needle. David taught me this. I can't tell you how useful this made my chopstick voicing tool. I mean, it's really, really a, a, an improvement. Beautiful. Yeah, I think we got a good look at it. Good. Um, and, and by the way, I don't know if everyone knows, you can pin someone's video. Um, if you select on their image, there's a dot, dot, dot. You can pin their video. If anybody's ever showing anything and you want to take a closer look, it's probably the best way to do it. Um, we got David Anderson back on board here. He's asking me to unmute him. So I'll do that. Okay. You had me muted. Yeah, welcome back, David. <laughs> Am I back now? Yes. <laughs> you filthy. <laughs> you muted me. Is this some kind of a. Bill Bondi is also showing us his. Uh, oh, wow. Chopstick voicing tool. Right. But he does not have it bent, which is. Uh, That's which troubling. Was... That's troubling. very <laughs> troubling. No, you got to bend it up to really get the full advantage of this beautiful. He's bowing. He's bowing. Uh, this, that, 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 you know, I stole this from Udo Steingraber. He said, this is a good trick. He said, this is a good thing. And I said, what is it? And he said, well, you retain the string cuts, but you do exactly what smacking out the string cuts with a, with a ch sugar, what do you call it? Sugar coating, voicing tool does. It kind of tears the string cuts up and you don't want to do that. We had a long conversation last week with Eric Johnson about <clears throat> you don't want to take when you file hammers, you don't want to take the string cuts out. You just want to make them from long, from 10 millimeters long to two or three millimeters long. And you want them to be very shallow. You don't want to take them all the way out because good players. Mm. Eric taught a class someplace, some kind of expanded class via Zoom someplace. And he had this player on, the last famous player, the last 20 minutes. And he talked about how he would play on and off the string cuts for different numbers. So I believe the string cuts are necessary. And if you obliterate them, it's not good. Anybody else have thoughts about that? Have, disagree with me or? Have thoughts about I, I have a question that came up, um, and that is uh, 
during, during one of our sessions when we were reviewing the Boaz lectures on Wednesdays. We were talking about yeah. hammer filing and talking about how, you know, it's interesting to understand that the string cuts are useful and the pianist might use them um, for nuances in their playing, as we talked about um, last week. Question is, if the hammers are severely off center from the strings, and then you go in to do a filing of the hammers, then do you want to get rid of the string cuts before you align the hammers to the strings so that you yeah, can- Yeah, if the hammers are, if the hammers are like ridiculously un misaligned with the strings, it's a different story. You have to build your own your new string cuts at the right place because alignment and hammer to string mating is, takes precedence. Right. And then there was also another tip that came in when we were talking about that, um, that if you want to deepen the string cuts a little bit, you can, you know, insulate your hand from getting the oils on the strings, but you press down on whatever strings. Uh, and then pound the hell out of the string with, the hell out of the string. smack it at triple forte or whatever for about 20 seconds. And that's, the insane recovery, like if you go too far with the, with the with the uh, with the tube of air under the string cut, you can just put your thumb on the string and just pound the heck out of it for ten or fifteen times, and it's like the equivalent of four or five hours of of playing on that note. So you can not take it all the way out, but take it a lot of the way out. Take that early edge out, right? Because here's the deal. Here's another deal that really confuses piano technicians, I think. You get the piano voiced and it sounds so beautiful and so warm to you and so clear and so sweet. But then somebody hears you playing it that's four or five, six feet away from the piano and they say, wow, it's it's a little too soft. Mm. And I want you to really understand that's why sometimes artists and performers aren't happy with the so-called softer hammers voiced, quote, warmer, unquote, because it doesn't have that, that pop. Even at low volume, they need to feel like, bam, it's, it, it smacked the string a little bit. It should be very golden at low volume, but it should still be there. And there should absolutely be a kinesthetic pop, like a, like almost a feeling of a snap when you play the note on any piano that's set up for performance, um, much past mezzo forte and certainly into forte. You want, you want some, what I call kinesthetic snap. You don't want to dull that initial ping because serious players love that. If you take it away from them, they'll be angry. Ask me how I know. I have made several abject, abject failures in that realm. Anybody else? Anybody else gotten fired for over voicing or weird voicing or anything like that it was interesting in in sally phillips lecture that we have in the library um where she talks about concert prep and um he, I, she what i was fascinated with is the and i was there too in person too just like the, the brightness of the piano on the stage you know right there in front of the pianist you're almost like oh my god this is kind of crazy how bright and poppy and you know, it's really in your face and it's really almost abrasive. But, you know, how was she talked about? Well, you need that sound locally in order for it to mix in the hall properly and come out rich and soft and, you know, and, uh, and especially cool. with Steinway hammers, especially with Steinway hammers, especially with hammers that have been built up with hardness. It's that maybe too ringy, springy sound at low volume so that at 30 feet out in the audience, 
it sounds ooh nice and warm. It doesn't sound like it does on the player's end. That's the point I'm trying to get to. What the piano sounds like to you from the player's side may be strikingly different than what anybody's going to hear the piano hears. And yeah, for me, as a musician, that, yeah, go ahead. Well, and part of it is just education process for the player, you know. Say, all right, go out and stand four feet away from the rim and listen to me play the piano. And then put your head in the piano. It's brighter than you think. It's It speaks more than you think. It's It's an awesome sound. It's different. The sound is different. The piano psychoacoustically feels different from the most pianos from the player's end to the list to the recording end or the microphone end or the listeners end. what i was going to say is uh as a, no. as a person playing you know music i played electronic keyboards you know with a band with electric guitars and electric bass and all of the synth instruments and things like that also played with the big band and it's I actually find it very difficult just as a musician to reconcile the sound that I hear locally with what people are hearing out in the audience. You know, what I, I always notice when I'm up on stage, I'm like, this must be terrible. You know, this, this is too loud and this is a problem. But, you know, as a, as, as a musician or even as someone preparing pianos, you have to understand, you have to have a deep understanding of how location relates to sound. You know, everything that you hear up close, uh, whatever's closer, you hear louder, right? Whatever's farther away, you hear, hear more softly. So that's important to consider. And it's also important to go out, you know, like if I am a keyboard player in a rock band or something, um, or in a big band piano player, to have someone go play the piano and me go out in the audience and say, oh, okay, actually, I need to play even louder. You know, um, that's, a, that's a big issue with... Uh, with pianos in a big band setting. It's like, I can hardly hear myself at all in the first place. Um, so yeah, that's that's a really good point, the discrepancies. Can I uh, yeah. introduce uh, Larry, in case he wants to share, Larry Lobel, uh, do you still have something maybe you wanna share about your usage with the, the chopstick tool there? Yeah, tell, tell us about that. Okay, uh, I believe this is the chopstick voicer that Jürgen sells. Um, though I didn't buy it from Jurgen, I got it at a Fazioli class at a convention, and I I think Fazioli uh, was the first one to come out with this. And um, it looks like a pen. Um, oh, that's another kind. Yeah, I had that kind too. Yeah, it's got a a cylinder, which is released by you press the the button on the top, and it releases this cylinder. And it comes all the way out. Yeah. So for storage, you have the the pin uh, going inside, so it doesn't stab you, and it stores nicely that way. And then when you want to use it, you just reverse the cylinder and stick it in the pen. And this is held by uh, some jaws that clamp yeah. it and hold it very tightly. It doesn't slip out. And um, you can you can put it at any length, any position that you need it. Um, and then, if you ever need to, uh, if the needle breaks or if you need to change it, it's just held in with some CA glue. So you can use the solvent for CA glue and then glue in another pin. And I find that much more manageable than trying to deal with those microscopic set screws which have become harder and harder with failing vision. Oh, yeah, tell me there. again how you do it, brother. Tell me again how you do it, real quick. Um, I see the, it. the needle is held in with in, into the cylinder here with, with CA glue. Uh -huh. uh, and you just glue it in. And then, and then there's a solvent you can use to get it. When you want to take it out, you just use the solvent, take it out, and then... Uh, it and that's right. Wow. Um, and so it's got a reach of about um, extended all the way out. It's it's more than a foot long, um, but you can retract it so that it's just about six inches long. And I use it 
in the short way for uh, little sugar sugar coating in the grooves. This is the most wonderful tool. Uh, it's been a real boon for me. So that's the one Jurgen sells. That's I'm great. Sure. Cool. Okay, yeah, so Jurgen confirmed, Jurgen yeah. confirmed that he does sell this one in the okay. chat as well. Yeah. Yeah. He and he, a different one, Carl. Yeah. I don't know if he still sells the one that I have, but he did for a number of years. Um, I want somebody to tell me a challenge they've had in the last 30 days. Thank you, Larry. When they were working on a, a piano and they, they couldn't get something right, either about the tuning, the voicing, the regulation, the setup, whatever. They couldn't figure something out. Come on, be bold. Well, this crowd, now everybody's perfect. Uh, I don't know. That's not a great question. Nobody makes mistakes here or has any problems. Oh, they're just solved. <laughs> I've got, I say a lot of times in my class, I don't have closets okay. full of skeletons. I have. Okay. I'm curious. So Cy Schuster said he introduced a topic, but he also said something earlier, which I, which I was curious about. Apparently, he coded computer programming in COBOL uh, back when you put punches in a piece of paper. And that was the same type of tool he used. <laughs> it was a pencil. Uh, it looked like the mechanical pencil with like a punch at the end. Uh, yeah. That's fascinating. Um, but he also said he's terrible at keyframe betting. And that is not a bad thing to topic to bring up, just kind of. Great thing to bring up. How the heck do you get that right? Yeah. And efficiently and quickly too, you know, so it doesn't take forever. First thing that comes to mind is that device that you show in your lecture, actually, on uh, you in your how to make a piano sing lecture. Yes. Uh, it's a device from uh, WNG. WNG. Yeah. And you get to set it on top of the action and it has a little gauge and seems... it's just idiot proof. It's literally idiot proof. You know, um, you set it on the action in a certain way that they give you instructions for, and then you lift up on the the glide bolt. That's are, are you screw it up, and as soon as you see any movement, yeah, it, 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 you. It's easy. It's the easiest for my weak hands. It's certainly the easiest protocol. I'll take over for what people might have missed, David, because you cut out again. Your internet's a little weak today. Did I? I? Yeah. Damn. Um, or you can reiterate it. But I think what people missed is uh, it's a device. It's got a little gauge on the front of it. Looks like a clock, you know, or maybe. Uh, the tire pressure gauge um, on a on a good quality uh, tire pump, uh, bike tire pump, and um, you just set it on top of the action. It's got a little adjustable, uh, um, movable thing that's on a spring attached to it that comes into contact with the bottom of the key bed, and it allows you to rotate the um, the tuning pin like objects, I forget what you, the glide bolts, if you want to just call them the glide bolts, yeah. um, glide bolt adjusters until you see that gauge stop moving. And that allows you to know uh, when there's a transition between it coming into contact with the key bed and not. And then you just kind of move that gauge around and adjust the various glide bolts. You don't have to do any knocking or tapping or, or anything like that. You don't have to take the keys out of the piano. You don't have to pick the, you know, have to pick the keyframe up with your fingers. You don't have to do any of that stuff. It's super simple and super elegantly precise as well. Now I'm curious, Sai, did you know about the that um, WNG betting tool? You can mention it in the chat. Um, but yeah, it seems pretty. Uh, seems quite quite effective. And again, if anybody has it, like right on hand, they're welcome to bring it on camera and. Carl seems to somehow have all his tools very organized and at, within arm's reach. Exactly. Up again, I'm pretty impressed with that. <laughs> uh, but let's let's uh, I'll go on to the next comments here first. 
so he might come back with it. Um, let's see. Moving cap stands. Let's see. Moving cap stands. What do we think? Should we ask for some clarification on what that means? That means that's a challenge for that person. Right. I, I imagine. Yeah. A challenge for a lot of people. That's why they don't do it. Oh, it's, moving capstans on the key, not raising them up and down, but actually moving exactly. the key. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. very frightening. Oh, Carl's got a tool. He's going to hold it up here to the camera. I'll pin his video. Um, yeah, you can hold it in front of yourself, actually, because you have a dark background. There you go. And it just those little feet. Can, can I, am I unmuted? Let me say something about this. Yeah, go you know, it. I also, I, 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 in the Yamaha class, when they're talking about stage pianos that are well regulated, and you get there and there isn't quite enough aftertouch, it's be, they say rather than raising the hammer line and taking away power, what you should, what's happened is the key bed has moved. And what you should do is push down the glide bolts and raise up the keys because they to, to the 10 millimeters they were supposed to be. On this gauge, four thousandths of an inch equals a, a tenth of a millimeter at the key height, but two tenths of a millimeter at the dip. You can get a lot of extra aftertouch. So when I have a piano where I don't quite have enough aftertouch, I will go in and I will take like the three center glide bolts. And with this gauge, I'll turn them down like two thousandths of an inch, three thousandths of an inch. It's not going to give you a knock. It's not going to cause anything, but it's going to get you a little extra aftertouch really easily. Right. The, these, the glide bolts, if you look at the old Steinway manual, were called TR screws. And the TR stood for touch regulation screws. I mean, wow. we, we have this idea that it's verboten to actually use these things to mess with the touch. That ha I mean, you don't want to overdo it. This is a very subtle thing. But you can improve the touch a little bit by just depressing the glide bolts. And this WNG tool lets you do it in a very calibrated way. You know, That's exactly right. And David, I think this is also just useful from the general topic that you brought up in the very beginning. I think this was when we started, not beforehand. But you were talking about, you know, what's the final 10%? You know, what is the exacting things that you really do to bring a piano into shape? And I can see that something like this, you know, having this tool and something like um, Carl is talking about, it's a very subtle, it's very subtle knowledge. And it's a very subtle action that you can take um, to change things. But that seems like it falls in the category of that kind of final 10% oh, well, things. It absolutely does. The most important part of the 10% in terms of regulation, I think, is just general evenness of the action, but more, even more, evenness of the aftertouch. Player after player after player after player, hundreds of players have told me, yeah, as long as I can, as long as the bump is the same for every note, as long as playing super soft, I can play through that bump and it feels the same on every note. I'm good. So getting the aftertouch exactly to match in terms of your fingers feel from the sharp is, you know, only the tier one guys get that right every, um, like maybe 60, 70% of the time. There's a lot of times they're just, there's a discrepancy in new 50, 60, 70, $90,000 pianos between the aftertouch distance on the sharps and the aftertouch distance on the, on the naturals. And it's not so much distance. I don't care about that. It's feeling. The feeling is different. And finally, and you can speak to this way better than I can, Carl, Yamaha now teaches in the Little Red Schoolhouse that aftertouch is a field thing. You can measure what you can measure, but aftertouch in the final analysis is a field thing. So how do you get it? How do you make that balance of raising blow distance a little bit and not getting the 
key travel more than you know 10.2 millimeters or less than 10 that's those are the sacred parameters that players like they like it around 10 a little bit more than 10 so how do you do that that's well, listen i'm i i always i, I mean i always like to take the easiest path and, I, and, you know, a little tiny tweak of the capstan and slightly raising the hammer line, you know, if, if, if it makes the aftertouch feel more even, that's what I do. It's so that's much exactly easier than right. mixing with the punchings. Or... That's right. And it doesn't, it doesn't add ex- anything except a, or a, a, it, it takes away maybe a half a millimeter of blow distance. Not, not enough with most pianos to make any significant difference. So you have that little slack area. I agree, Carl, that's exactly what I do too. I'd much rather, you know, subtly mess with the blow distance than I would with the, with the key travel. I like to have the key travel pretty sacred. Uh, Phil, Bondi, uh, chime in on that, man. I know you, regulate and do that final step on a lot of pianos so can you unmute uh mr bondi mr Jim? i have selected to ask to unmute him and i think he has to confirm there he goes all right am i on now you're on we're on no uh that's that's it david um i have the pleasure of working with someone from the east coast too who sets basically sets up the pianos that i that i use in naples there's two d's and a c7 and between the two of us, we have him dialed in pretty good. Uh, he usually comes over once a year about this time, just goes through everything. And then during the season, pretty much my job is like those little, oh, that, that little tube voicing that you were talking about, or that just that minor touch on the, uh, on the ham, on the capstans or, or, or and on the capstans more than anything. And um, very, I'm very fortunate to be working with someone from Steinway who knows all these little tricks too. So yes, everything that's being said so far is uh, in practice here. Awesome. Thank you, cool. brother. Uh, anybody else? I'm, I'm really wanted to hear the wisdom of this room. So any, any well, other tips and tricks you have about this final process, that'd be great. I got a message here is, is private. So let me just read it here and see if there's something we can do. Um, it was from Mark Campbell. He said, in regards to capstans, he have, may have missed the question, but if, if we'd like to have him, I think, join the call later, we can discuss it. Um, he works with action geom- geometry quite a bit. So I think the question was generally moving capstans, like, you know, how do you go about it and make sure that, uh, you know, I mean, I would be afraid to mess it up. <laughs> I think that would be probably the, you want to, end up with things better than when you started, not worse. And I think that would probably be my biggest concern. Um, well, see if I'm going to ask to unmute Sai, and if you have anything to share, go for it. Um, if not, then we can move on and you can tell us when you're ready. I was um, just going to, um, getting back to, uh, to keyframe bedding. I, I, oftentimes I get to the glides and the tool that I have doesn't reach down to the top of the glide bolt or your tuning hammer doesn't get in there or it's got a screw top. It's like, what are the three or four most common tools that you need to get to the most, to most of the glide bolts to adjust those stupid things? Great question. And, and I just want to make another comment, Sai. I think you have an amazing outfit today. Um, <laughs> and your home is like filled with some Asian flair and you're wearing a tie-dye t-shirt and a headband. I am... I'm working on Carl Lieberman here. I'm not... <laughs> <laughs> I, I aspire someday to be at that point. Uh, the other, the other thing I wanted to share for y'all, I love analogies, and I came up with this great analogy: a piano is a harp with a typewriter under it. There so you go. Pianos don't need tuning. Nobody was ever blocked from practicing or performing because the piano was out of tune. But if that damn typewriter doesn't work, you're toast. So that's what I use to describe why we need to put effort into the mechanism. So yeah, that's great. Oh, because it's, it's also the player can feel an absolutely striking positive change when let off and drop in the springs and 
all the regulation points are in, it feels like a new piano. When they're not, given the given the build quality instruments, when they're not, it just feels a little. So I, I love I love learning to do stuff by feel. I, I did uh, sloppy or sluggish or something. I did in Estonia uh, yesterday. It hadn't been serviced for a while. Uh, I love I love those pianos. Yeah, the Teflon powder on the knuckles and as and tightened up all the action screws and everything and put it back in. And as often happens in a piano that has light wear, a lot of the notes were blocking. And I love to feel that just by by playing the note and it just let off just by feel. You know, you just yeah, play. absolutely. But you got to play really soft to feel that, it, especially in the treble. You do. That's the way I've set let off for about 15 years. Yeah. On a stool in front of the piano, just listening, listening to the ghosting and never even looking at the hammers and the strings, just trusting that I can get them. Once I know that this piano action, I can get the, the hammers exactly where I want them by, by sound, by how heavily they ghost when I, when I, do a certain kind of test flow, very soft test flow with my fingers. You know, that's another thing I want to, I always bring up in classes and I, I always want to bring it up every place. You have to develop like a, like a protocol of test flows to test different things in the action. And be repeatable. You can't, uh, you know, something that's really reliable for you to get the same every time and then practice it and use it. Um, Larry, you, you, you agree with that? Larry Lobel, you agree with that? I just asked to unmute him again. And uh, I, I, will, I will just second that and say, you know, I'm not always the best at it, but the one thing that I've noticed is when you do have something that's repeatable, some sort of a spine of a structure, to what yeah. you do, not only does it help you do it again and again, but it also helps you refine and improve it. Because you're used to doing it the same way, it allows sure. you to tweak the little things that are happening subtly as you go. So definitely second it, just from a general perspective. Phil, you're unmuted. And then I just wanna also say, um, Mark was the one, Mark Campbell was the one who said he might have some advice about moving the, um, cap stands and I unmuted him. So Mark, if you want to jump in whenever you're welcome to, um, if you're available, you don't have a video I see, but it looks like you do have audio. But uh, yeah, Phil, any thoughts on? Um... No, I was going to ask Larry Lobel. Oh, okay, Larry Lobel. Let's yeah. unmute Larry. Yeah. You're asking about uh, test flows, David? That's right, test flows and getting protocols for everything and developing those protocols as it's just like a hitter or a pool player. They have a protocol or a golfer. They have a protocol for every single shot. They have a way to do it that they've developed over thousands of hours. And we should do the same thing. You should have, you know, yeah, maybe up to I, half a dozen different test flows for different different things I, you're testing on the, on the action. I certainly agree with the idea of having protocols, but in a lot of the situations that I work in, you can do that during the time that's uh, where, where you're not under pressure. But I work under a lot of high pressure situations and a lot of it is just kind of improvising and coping with whatever the crisis of the moment is. Uh, so right. uh, don't, you don't, don't always get to follow those, those protocols. Um, right. Also, as far as testing the piano sound, I rely on playing actual music more than blows. Of course, I use blows as I'm voicing and stuff, but I always try to play something. And I use particular pieces of music that are going to um, test the diff different capabilities of the piano. So, you know, pieces with staccato, uh, I, I try to simulate what the pianist is going to do. I can't come anywhere near what, what the pianist will do, but I have certain pieces I can play that test for fast repetition, for staccato, um, different types of playing that 
the pianist is likely to use. So I always try to implement some of those to make sure that I'm dealing with real real music that the piano is going to be uh, subjected to. That's correct. Right. Um, great point. I'd like to also talk about spring strength, because that is, as I get older and move deeper into the precision of preparing a piano, I really see that the strength of the repetition spring makes a lot of difference, makes a lot of difference. Um, and it, there should be no feeling back through the key. You know, there should be no, no kickback of the spring, but it should be lively. Unless the spring is relatively lively, you're not going to get re the repetition you want from that spring. I'm telling you, I've, I've said it every possible way you can send it, set it over the last 35, 40 years. And on the edge of kickback, basically a little slower in the bass, but from the, from the tenor section, then up into the treble, you want it to be lively. You don't want it to be uh, slow. I, I heard that at the beginning of my career in, in London Steinway Hall. Yes, yeah, hammer should rise like a, like a luxurious morning sunrise. And it's like too soft, <laughs> too soft. Doesn't give you maybe I'm fast forward, yeah. But you know what though? I would the, the the part of the sunrise where you first see the sun, maybe that kind of like a oh there it is, and it just kind of like pops that little yeah little light. But I don't know about the rest of the luxurious sunrise. That's that's a little bit slower. <laughs> well, that's what they meant, you know, slower. And it just never worked out for me. Just never felt as good as a little bit. Uh, ever so that's another thing to watch out for um, yeah and someone as someone who's more recently you know gone through the process of understanding you know what's important in regulation and the things that are easy to pass up um, the spring strength is a really easy for people who haven't done a lot of regulation to just forget about and it can be so nerve wracking because it's like, oh, oh, look, I got the hammer line perfect. Oh, this is so wonderful. And then you just play the keys a little bit and it's out of whack and you go, oh, man, now I got to adjust the hammer line again. <laughs> right. and, it, and all of a sudden, you know, seven hours later, you go oh, I don't know the with the spring strength. <laughs> so, yeah. yes, yes. And that could have to do with the strength of the repetition arm pinning it could have to do with so many things hmm. that's why the final 10 percent if you have a day or two is like in the down in the trenches man it's really setting things from the bottom up and you're building a foundation of function of excellence and when you get done and you add the crown jewels of voicing and tuning, then the piano sings. Thomas Zolz, the, the longtime Fazioli and Yamaha dealer in Chicago, had his longtime uh, technician, David Graham, who's a great piano technician, does a lot of concert uh, and recording stuff in Chicago. He says, it's, it's amazing. He's just one of those piano technicians that he can sit down at a piano for 20 minutes or a half an hour and doesn't seem like he's doing much and then plays it and walks away from it. And it's like, wow, that sounds a lot better. And then you sit down and feel it. And it's like, wow, that feels a lot better. That's the point you want to get to where your craft is so intuitive you can just immediately tell, oh, this needs this, this needs this. Um, I like Carl, that. Phil. I've got a, I'll take a second. Whatever. There's been quite a bit of activity in the chat, and I'll kind oh, of go awesome. through what's there. Yeah, um, yeah. And we'll see. 
so first of all, let me start with Cy Schuster because I guess he's maybe switching up his mic or something. So he, he couldn't be heard while he was saying something. He said, and this goes back to something we were talking about earlier. He puts Teflon powder on knuckles and, and then the hammers were blocking. He plays the note very softly and he can hear that the hammer is blocking on the string before a let off. Yeah. So he could force it to escape with more force. Um, I think in reading that, I couldn't process it. Did that make sense to you, uh, uh, David? Well, sure you can. It will let off if you, but it's it's blocking on the string. So it'll go blah, 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 on a soft flow. You don't want that. Mm. So you have to bring it slightly off the string. Got it. Uh, Bruce Gibson said, Right out of college, he did a regulation on an upright. When he was, quote unquote, done, he remembered he hadn't tightened the action screws. He tightened them up and blew the regulation, started again, only made that mistake once. <laughs> yeah. 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 Ooh, I've done that more than once. That's terrible. Yeah. And it's the simple, simple things, you know, that you have foundational steps. Also, you know, you go through those like 37 steps or whatever, and, it, you know, the first step, you know, one of the first steps is like tighten the action screws. It's like, like yeah, ah, I, you know, forget that. It's, it's, it's something yeah. that could skip that. <laughs> tighten the action shoes and make sure. I will say, uh, it's in David's cutting out a little bit, I'm sure probably for everybody. So I'll, I'll cut mm -hmm. in and say something that came up uh, just the other day on our team. Um, is just tightening the action screws on a piano it can make a huge difference. Um, and it can be something that uh, is deceptively valuable for a customer that if you don't have a lot of time, it's something you can, you can probably charge more than you think you should be able to, because it might be something relatively quick for you to do, but all of a sudden you're done, the piano sits down and the action feels punchier, it feels more responsive. In some senses, it might even feel like they have a new piano. Um, so for those people that don't recognize the value in, in that, I'll put that out there. Um, David, uh, would you cut out a little? If you're going to do a, uh, like a, a day or a day and a half service, the vast majority of pianos I come up to that are eligible and I also repin the shank flanges because the shank flanges of most pianos I come up to that are that haven't had any work in a long time and that are somewhere between 10 and 40 years old have basically no friction in the flanges. And if you introduce some friction, the tone gets better, the touch gets better, everything gets better. If you introduce two or three grams of tension, it's kind of miraculous. Hello? Oh, I, sorry, I was talking when I was muted. <laughs> the comedy of errors here. <laughs> um, I actually think we're doing pretty well considering our guests dropped out. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think we're doing really well. But uh, uh, what I had asked is, is there something that you said before you said repin the shank flanges because you cut out a little bit? Uh, is there something? Yes, uh, if you're doing a day's worth of work or a day and a half or two days worth of work, it's always good to measure the friction on the shank flanges at the very least. And most of them are zero grams to one gram. Most of them are, are, are swinging 10, 12, 14 times. That's just, it's too loose. So if they're wooden flanges, you need to repin them. Perfect. Um, I'll go back to the comments here. So Sai also said another way he sets let off is to push the key very slowly until just before let off and then play the key very hard from there. If it's too close, there will be no sound. If too far, it will be too loud. Wow. Oh, interesting. Um, Phil Bondi 
said, yes, this, this is where touch protocol comes into play. Um, Sai, is it true that keys can bobble if springs are too weak? Any thoughts on that? Too weak spring and you still have some sort of bobbling? Only if the repetition arm is too tight. And it, then it will bobble no matter what the springs do. I've run into that too on new pianos. Got it. Uh, Annika Byerly um, said, Annika. Do you know Annika? On, on the internet, yes. Awesome. Uh, spring strength, regarding spring strength, discover how much effect uh, rep, rep lever pinning has on the ability to properly set spring strength was a game changer. Yeah. Mm. It's not something I was really much aware of before we were talking about it. I mean, I know it's important, but just that it's such a key factor that you're considering to think about. Um, David said, but spring speed is a function of hammer shank and rep friction. Larry said, uh, oh, the raising of the hammer should be like the sunrise behind Carl on his background of the, the little piece of sunrise coming over the earth there. Yeah, I think that's about what I was describing. <laughs> Um, Susan Klein said, yes, you have a bad trade-off with spring tension and other problems if the flange friction isn't high enough. Right. And I have kind of a couple more comments on that. Uh, Sai said, I'm glad to know, David, you prefer to tweak blow over dip for fine aftertouch. That's very helpful. Uh, Susan Klein, I have everything. Okay, that's just about being in from COVID. Uh, Bruce Gibson, how many spinets? It's almost impossible at times to get those hammers to check at any blow. <laughs> yeah, um, on many spinets. All wonderful tips and tweaks, Nancy says. Thanks, at what point do you recommend a full major regulation for your regularly maintained pianos? Any interesting answers for that? I would say, how much do they play the piano? If it feels, if if you come to the piano and do some test blows and play a little bit and see that the let off is an inch away from the strings and the drop is farther than that. And the let off is, I'm sorry, the, the after touch is too deep. And, you know, the, the shanks are resting on the hammer rail. You know, it needs a day of work. It needs a bunch of stuff. If it needs that stuff, it needs other stuff. Right, it needs everything to be lubricated. It do you have a Do you have a number that you think of? I mean, for for like a like a school piano, of course, it's going to be way more often. But for like a home piano, I often think if your piano hasn't had a full one over the regulation in like three or four years, yeah. you probably should do something. Like just go go. You go should, through it, you right? should, it, it needs a day of work. Yeah, the pedals are probably out. The God knows what the hammers look like. I mean, it needs a day of work. It needs a good six, seven, eight hours of work. And what I do is, okay, I charge my hourly rate. And then I take, because I'm in one place all day and don't have to drive around and dick around with going other places and burning gas and stuff. I charge a day rate. And it's usually... 80 to 85 percent of my retail rate and uh that way you can do a day or two days of work and still be under a couple of thousand bucks and really literally have like a new piano really the what two days of service can do to a good piano whether it's an upright or a grand is phenomenal phenomenal yeah yeah and i also i don't know if I don't know if you remember if you said this explicitly, but for, for me, I think in recommending regulation and more extensive regulation, I often think before it's too late, you know, there's, there's certain situations where a piano can, again, just coming from a perspective of someone who's been closer to the beginning or the, the growth period of learning to regulate pianos, there's a temptation to only recommend regulation when that piano is really far out. And it's like, you know, everything's all wacky, so I'm going to fix it. Well, there's a problem there because it's often so wacky that you can't fix it. 
And so you go in there and you go through all the regulation steps and it's actually not that much better because, you know, all the felts, you know, are compacted in some weird way. So then when you rotate it, then they got off center and, you know, you adjusted this and you adjusted that and it, it just didn't sit right. So it might have made things worse in a way. So I often look at pianos that are, they're actually in relatively good shape and say, hey, let's save this before it gets too far out of whack. And then, you know, neaten everything up. It's kind of like what we were talking about, the hammer string grooves. You know, if, if, you, if you've got hammer string grooves that are centered on the, the hammer, that's, that's good. And you don't really want to get to the point with a piano where the hammer string grooves are far off from the center, because then you've got to file away the grooves altogether. Um, Carl Lieberman is showing me something. Say, say what you want to say. Oh, he wants to show these. Uh... Listen, I, I just bought these scissors online. They're Chinese knockoffs of German scissors. They're $12.95. The company is called Guggenheim, G-U-G-G-E-N-H-E-I-N.com. These are the cutest little scissors. They're sharp as can be. They feel great. You know, they're a Chinese knockoff of the $200 German scissors. I love them. <laughs> I'm I, I got a pair like that with a different brand name. It's the same thing. Sharp, lovely, 12 bucks a piece. I bought like three of them. They're awesome. Nice. A rare find considering our previous discussion with Jurgen about the danger of buying cheap Chinese knockoffs. <laughs> yeah, so, oh, so. These are really good. Cool. That's good. These aren't piano tools. They tend to go El Cheapo in piano tools. Yeah. They're made for other consumers, so they can't be pieces of merit like most Chinese piano tools are. David, I'm really proud of us. I think we pull up quite a nice episode here with a with a change at the last minute. We're yeah. rounding out about two minutes left. Uh, we're putting the links in the in the chat to uh, give your feedback, which you know still even even though it was a little bit. Uh, a little bit rough. We'd love to hear what you have to say. Um, and also to sign up for next Saturday early, if you just want to make sure you get on board, get the notifications. And we're going to do the last installment Wednesday of our four-part review of Boaz's lecture on voicing. So there's the there's a 120-minute lecture that's private to subscribers only. But uh, if you want to show up live, um, you can either just pay once or become a uh, eight dollar a month subscriber, and you can at least see it live. And we'll do a little discussion afterwards. We've been playing around with uh, breaking people out into discussion groups, um, and you know, getting a little time to socialize with colleagues and learn some things. Uh, pairing people, more expert people with am more amateur people, and it's been it's been fun. So join us this Wednesday. There's a sign up link to join us this Wednesday for the final installment of. OS's lecture on voicing. I'd love to have you there. David, any final any final comments and words? We got we actually a lot of questions are still in the chat. So well, that's awesome. this again. Yeah. I'll be I'll be happy if you and I can pick them out and select some. I'd be happy to answer some to the to whoever left them in the chat room. I'd be happy to do that. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll have the um, I'll have the chat record, and so I'll yeah. just grab that. And my emails, my email address is all over the internet, so you can send me David at davidandersonpianos.com, whatever questions you want to, and I'll be happy to answer them. Very I'm nice. A nerd, and you know, I'm excited by piano questions. And thanks to everyone. Thanks to everyone that paid attention and participated and thanks to our special guests uh, who jumped in uh carl yeah. and Sai and uh and if phil i don't know if phil's still here yeah, he might phil jump. And Larry Larry. Larry yeah we we might pick a topic and have a panel discussion you know that that could be fun i think i've been saying that for a long time i think it would be a great idea i think it's a fabulous idea yeah. and have challenging questions on tap you know? Yeah. ETD and oral. Cool. <laughs> yeah. 
Say that again, Sean. Hi, my Hi. ECD and what? Uh, the combination, hybrid tuning, uh, oral tuning and, and uh, tuning devices. Oh, yeah, definitely. My friends, thank, thank, you, thank you so much. much. And uh, if you so desire, we'll see you next week. The brand new slate of characters and awesomeness. All right, cool. Thank you so much. Thanks for our special guests. And, uh, and we'll see you, David, next time. It's great. Get to... better, Boaz. Get better. Yes, yes. I'll send out our good, good thoughts to Boaz. Bye, guys. Catch you later. Thank you so much for giving us an hour of your time. Remember that you can catch us live online every Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. That's right. Go to pianotechradio.com to register so you can interact live and ask questions of our guests. See you next week.